Fairy Meet Fairy Souls, it is Nina and you are watching Fairy Chamber channel. Story of Beauty and the Beast truly is tale as old as time. You can find different versions from Beauty and the Beast from Africa, from India, from France, Italy and from ancient Greece. Uh, two most famous fairy tale versions of Beauty and the Beast they were written in the 18th century France by two educated women and because of that I got very inspired to make little friends hairdo for myself and I was inspired by a tutorial from Lupsy as always all the links are in the description box it took forever to make this but I think it's rather nice what do you think? one of the earliest versions of Beauty and the Beast comes from ancient Greece from the story of Cupid and Psyche in Greek Psyche means spread of life and Cupid means passion the story of Psyche and Cupid it has been told in ancient Greece already 400 BC and it was written down around 200 BC by a man called Lucius Apuleius in his fairy tale collection of called the Golden Ass. Psyche was a beautiful princess. She was so beautiful that even the goddess of love Aphrodite got jealous of her and she taught her son Cupid to shoot an arrow into Psyche's heart so that Psyche would fall in love into the ugliest man of the world. Cupid, however, got so smitten by the Psyche's beauty that he accidentally shot himself to the heart with his own arrow. This caused that Psyche had real difficulties to get any suitors because Cupid had actually shot himself and his parents got really restless because of this and they actually went to see an oracle and the oracle told them that Psyche would marry a, an invisible monster and the parents got really worried because of this then one day Psyche was kidnapped by the west wind Zephyr he, and he took her into a magical palace and there in the palace Psyche started to live and she was very surprised what is going to happen now she had no idea what was going on she had heard about the prophecy but she didn't know what was waiting for her and so it happened that each night Cupid arrived and went to see her into her bedchamber and it was always dark and it always happened during the night and he turned himself in invisible and Psyche was very scared is this now the monster little by little Psyche started to fall in love with this invisible monster the monster made her promise that uh, see his face and find out his true identity but of course Psyche who was in love with the monster now she found out it one night and she looked Cupid's beautiful face in the candlelight this made Venus furious Psyche she was thrown down from the palace she went to the temple of Ceres and Ceres is the Greek goddess of grain and Ceres told her that now you have pissed off the goddess you need to do what she tells you to do and you know, she gave Psyche different kinds of tasks so that she she so she could like condemn her sins against the goddess and many times Cupid came came out to help her but the story of Beauty and the Beast it is universal and what one thing that makes it very different compared to many other very famous fairy tales like Cinderella or Snow White when there is oppressed um, uh, underdog, the hero, or usually a heroine, <laughs> that is suppressed by their family or their their relatives. She meets a prince in a ball or somewhere, or doing the song, doing three minutes they fall in love, and then they are separated. Then after some triumphs they end up together. This is not the case with the Beauty and the Beast and I think this is why it's one of the most popular fairy tales ever made or ever told <laughs> by people. That is because in Beauty and the Beast there is the heroine who is always smart and beautiful as well. She's not some dumb head chicken. And then there is the beast which which is a person that usually does not give the best first impression if they are rude and then they slowly become much nicer and nicer people usually that can be because of misconceptions in the beginning why this makes me think about um, pride and prejudice somehow I don't know or it can be a person being hideous at first 
being half human and half animal and they turn out to be complete gentlemen and the love of the girl turns them into a human being and they live happily ever after so that's another very common version what it comes to Beauty and the Beast but this, this is the biggest difference that it has to other different fairy tales people can surprise you so there is always the surprise of element in Beauty and the Beast that does not exist in many other favorite famous fairy tales the whole story of Beauty and the Beast and different versions of it you can find that in pop culture and you can find that in other very very famous literal works I already mentioned Bright and Brick Justice that's because I've had very much a Jane Austen vibes recently but anyway you can find that also from stories like Cyrano, Hunchback of Notre Dame and Phantom of the Opera before I get into these two very famous literal version made by Beauty and the Beast and obviously the Disney animation I will tell you a true story from 16th century France that properly has inspired the stories from the 17th century about Beauty and the Beast 1547 in Canary Island some people made a great discovery they found a 10 year old boy who was whose body was completely covered with fur so he was half man and half animal in the eyes of people and unfortunately in 16th century and centuries before that there was this nasty custom that the royal people did around in European courts that they collected people with disabilities they were seen as half human and this boy who was all, all covered with fur he was seen half human and half animal and nowadays this condition of someone being covered completely with fur it is called hypertrichosis you can still find people with hypertrichosis today but it is very rare condition this boy got a Spanish name Pedro Gonzalez and he was actually given as a gift to the King of France Henry II in 1547 and Henry II he wanted to make an experience with his wife Caterina de Medici they wanted to see if this boy was actually a an animal or was he a, you know could he become a civilized human being so Pedro Gonzalez he got a new name Petrus Conchalus more Latin based and he got an education of a gentleman of 16th century 1559 Henry II passed away and his wife Caterina de Medici she became the Queen of France and if you know anything about history Caterina de Medici she was a cruel queen and she destroyed all the people who were against her she was a very famous matchmaker Caterina de Medici and she wanted to continue this experience with Petrus Gonzalos what if she would wed him with a woman that she would choose and then she would see if they would have kids would and if they would have kids would those kids also be furry or would they be animals completely so parents did let her to choose spouses for their daughters because otherwise off with their heads so Catherine of the Medici she, so, she chose a wife for Petrus and she chose a woman that was daughter of one of the servants in the court we do not know the last name of this woman who was chosen but we do know that her first name was also Catherine so the other rumor is that when she entered the wedding chapel and she saw her future husband she fainted because Petrus Gonzales was all covered with hair and at the same time her Majesty the Queen of France Catherine de Medici she had fun time in imagining what the fate would be for for this poor Catherine maybe this man would eat her or or like rip her, rip her apart or maybe her children would be all white animals and all kinds of crazy things and, or that poor Catherine would kill herself because she could not be in the presence of this beastly man when I first time heard this historical story for me the true monster or the true beast of this story was actually Catherine de Medici 
Despite the fact that they were in love, the life of the couple was very hard and very, very cruel. Altogether, Petrus and Catherine, they had ch seven children. Two of the oldest children, they did not have hypertirchosis. The third child had hypertirchosis, and it is said that four of the children, they had the same condition that their father had, and three did not have it. The couple ended up moving into Italy, into Parma, and there they were owned by Duke called Ranuccio Farnese, and there they were also this sort of pets or sightseeing for the visitors of the Duke. Look, here we have a hairy man and his wife and their children. And their children who had trichosis, they were sold to different European courts. So they became possession of these royal families. The family, they had to pose for several different portrait artists and those portraits of their families, they were sold or given as wedding gifts for different uh, European royals. Petrus Gonzalvus, he passed away in 1618 and then five years after that in 1623 Catherine passed away. So historical records also tell that they were both treated with disrespect and all the mem family members were treated with disrespect until the day they died. And people haven't even found their graves yet. The first literal version of Beauty and the Beast appeared in 1740 in this book, and it's a gorgeous book, and it's written by Gabrielle Suzanne Barbeau de Villeneuve. She wrote this book as a moral support for young women in France in 17th century because back then most of the marriages they were arranged by parents, and most of the time women they did not know who they were end up marrying with. This story, it is the first literal version of Beauty and the Beast and it is the most well-known version of Beauty and the Beast. This book, it was for adults. Anyway, this story has the main character, her name is Belle, which is French and means beautiful, obviously. And Belle, she is a daughter of a very wealthy merchant who also has connections with royal family. And she has lots of brothers, and she has lots of sisters, and she gets along brilliantly with her brothers, but all her sisters are very envy of her because she's very beautiful. And Belle, she also loves to read, and she loves to learn new things. The story began with her father going away into a business trip, and she asks Belle and her siblings what they want as a souvenir. And and all her sisters, they want beautiful clothes and jewelries and so on, but Belle only wants her father to bring her a beautiful rose. So then the beast finds him picking the flower, and he starts to threat him and says that you will be my servant from now on for, for trying to steal one of my roses. The father starts to beg, let me go to see my children first, then I return here and be your humble servant heavy heart father returns to his home and children see that he is very sad and Belle asks what is wrong father and the father tells him that he needs to move to the beast's castle and be his servant for the rest of his life but Belle says no no father I will go instead of you I asked you to bring me the rose so the bell goes to the beast's castle the way Belle sees Beast in this book is not that Beast is somehow horrible or cruel creature. He does not use violence or he does not he's not angry, he does not use violent language. The way Belle sees the Beast in this particular book is that Beast is somehow a bit disabled or that he has a bit slower mind. Belle she starts to explore the castle. So the beast, he doesn't come out as a cruel person, he just comes out as a bit um, clumsy person, perhaps more. Uh, and he tells Belle that he, she can explore all the castle as much as she wants and just try to make her feel comfortable. So the Belle, she starts to visit the garden and she finds the gardens filled with exotic birds, 
then there's a greenhouse where there is monkeys and all kinds of things then she opens the door of one of the rooms and suddenly she is in Paris Opera then she opens up another room and it and she is in theater and so she experiences all these kind of imaginative things and the storyteller of this of this book she explains that all those are optical illusions and optical illusions they really started to come out in 17th century they were very in with and Isaac Newton was developing all kinds of optical illusions so there's new kinds of inventions in this fairy tale and then the, each evening Belle is having dinner with the beast and each evening the beast is asking Belle would you come and sleep with me and politely Belle refuses so remember this is a fairy tale book for adults from the 17th century and then each night when Belle refuses not to sleep with the beast she starts to see these dreams of beautiful handsome prince and they usually meet in the garden of the beast and uh, they have these enlightened uh, intellectual discussions and she falls each night more and more in love with this handsome prince there isn't any mentions in this book these inanimate objects being the former servants of the castle but at some points you can read how be beauty she hears people chattering even though there isn't no one around so that might be the objects so what it happens that then beauty she starts to feel affection towards the beast she starts to find beast also quite lovable and then there starts to appear this fairy into her dreams as well this godmother of beauty and the godmother or the fairy she tells beauty to rethink is it more important to love a person that you will see in your dreams or this lovable creature that you will meet every day so then one day beast asks Belle if you would marry me and then Belle says yes and then beast turns into a prince and then they start to explain this whole complicated process how he became a beast so the story of beast goes that his father was a very beloved king and his mother was the queen and the queen when the king died the queen had to take over the country and to lead the country the country which in this case was some kind of imaginary france the country got into a war and the queen had to go to and the queen had to go to lead the army and the boy was left with her nurse which turned out to be an evil fairy it's a very common fairy tale motif if you have seen any of my previous videos about fairy tale origins and this evil fairy she is an old hag and she raises the prince from little boy to a uh, what 18 20 20 ish and she falls in love with the prince, this old woman, and she wants to marry the prince. And the prince is shocked, I cannot marry you. And as a revenge, the evil fairy turns the prince as a beast and says, You cannot, you will be a beast until you find a woman that marries you as a beast. The story gets even more complex because the, the, <laughs> the woman who took care of the bell, the godmother who appeared into her dreams she is a fairy she's a fairy and then uh, the evil fairy who took care of beast and fell in love with the beast she is her sister so godmother and the evil fairy are sisters and it gets even more weirder the, the it turns out that they have a third sister who was banished because she had a child with a human it was not not any human it was a king and <laughs> that king that was the sister that no and that particular king he was the brother of the queen and the queen was the mother of the beast so Belle she turns out to be a daughter of a fairy princess and and a mortal king 
uh, the mortal king he had he has been taken into a fairy prison or somewhere and uh, the mother of her has been banished because she slept with a mortal man but then when the curse is broke they are brought back and everyone uh, starts to learn all these things about each other's and including the fact that the beast and bell are are, are uh, relatives they are their cousins well in back in the days marrying your cousin especially in among royal family that was very very usual but it turns out that Belle is actually a royal person and that he she was found as a baby by this merchant and his wife and they just adopted her and that is why she never could adjust into the family perfectly so they end up getting married and they live happily ever after. Uh, her now stepsisters, they still continue to be envy and her brothers are just so happy to have her back and alive. And her adopted father, who she had always considered to be her real father, is very happy that she has now found her real family and that Beast has turned into a handsome prince and so on and they live happily ever after. I love the illustration in this book. It's gorgeous. I love it. I love it. I love it. And there's all this, all this kind of cool stuff, you know. <laughs> I love this book. But uh, the language was terrible. And you know, English is not my native language. I'm a native Finnish speaker. And this is written with like very old-fashioned English, translated from very old-fashioned French. It's just really difficult for me to read this, but it's beautiful. It, it's like a jewel and it shimmers. <laughs> but it's, the beginning was very enjoyable to read, but um, the end was like uh, watching a soap opera, really. It's very confusing. <laughs> then in the late of 18th century, there was another version written based on this book, and it was written by another French woman called Jean-Marie La Prince de Beaumont, and she took this same fairy tale, and she took away all these kind of extra soap opera stuff from this book, and all that very weird relation, relative things, and she made it much shorter fairy tale, and that fairy tale was meant for children, when that book was The Beauty and the Beast for Adults, this new one was for children, Beauty and the Beast for Children, and it had all the basic elements like in the story of the Villeneuve. Also in her version, Belle is a very educated woman, and she comes from not a royal background, but she is the daughter of a merchant, like, she's, uh, and she's a real do daughter of a merchant, she's not like an adopted fairy or changeling in that particular version which I think it's much nicer and more realistic. Jean-Marie de Beaumont, her fairy tales, they were meant for children, or more specifically, they were meant for young girls. And they had all these moral lessons, how a beautiful and educated smart woman should behave and should act. And Belle is like model example of that kind of lady. You can find different versions from this particular fairy tale of the Beaumont for children about Beauty and the Beast and you can find different versions of the animal that Beast is depicted to be. From France example there's lots of fairy tales where, where Beast is some kind of um, a white hawk and there's lots of versions where Beast is some kind of a bison and, or a bull. If you go to Finland, we have this kind of folk fairy tales inspired by Beauty and the Beast, where the beast is a moose or a bear or a dog. You can find this also from Russia and from Sweden and Northern Scandinavia. And then you can find, if you go to Africa, there's lots of stories where a beast is some kind of a monkey or an orangutan or some kind of a, of a gorilla. Then there's versions where Beast is somehow a frog. Well, sorry if Beauty and the Beast, it is very similar to the princess and a frog, so frog is quite natural. So you can find all kinds of animals that have been the Beast. 
It's very interesting when I started to read these folklore stories from Finland about beauty and the beast, different kinds of versions where there has been these stories of beast being some kind of a bear or a wolf or a moose, especially the bear and the moose, you can actually detect that after 10,000 years into shamanistic culture, times when people believed that in the totemistic cultures that they were descendant of um, moose or a bear and that is the base in many shamanistic culture in Eurasian areas and in many Native American tribes and probably it was something known all over the world among the first people who had shamanistic virtue this kind of belief for <laughs> holy lion between a woman a mortal woman and a spirit animal or the spiritual totem animal was actually originally a man that for some reason or another was turned into an animal but these kind of stories about you know women having relationship with um, half half bears and half animals they were, that was quite common entertainment back in the times especially especially in male gangs like uh, in a group that was building houses or something people actually entertained themselves by telling fairy tales that were slightly erotic and there is my favorite version of Beauty and the Beast is the 1991 movie this is the Finnish version I also have the English version and this is the special edition with two hours extras <laughs> and uh, I think I was 5 or 4 when I first time saw Beauty and the Beast straight when it came out to Finland in 1991 I think you can count from that how exactly old I am or how young I am and that was love at first sight. I actually found this research about these Disney blockbuster films and how each generation has this one particular blockbuster film that most people who, was, who were born in certain age are absolutely nuts about or it is their favorite movie. So for example, if you were born in the end of the 80s very likely your favorite Disney animation would be Beauty and the Beast and if you were born in the beginning of the 90s very likely your favorite Disney animation would be The Lion King and if you were born between 2000 and 2010 very likely your favorite Disney animation would be Frozen <laughs> and at least in my case that is very true because Beauty and the Beast is probably my favorite Disney animation even though in general I am absolutely crazy about animations not just Disney animations but I watch lots of animations and I was a child my childhood dream was to become an animator if someone didn't know that now I study illustration which is, which is such a just as good because I, when I was in art school I actually studied animation a bit and it was really difficult and I ended up doing illustration instead which is probably a good thing but still I, I have this very deep love and respect for animation as an art form I think it's amazing art form of course there's lots of people who were born in the end of the 80s and they love something completely different animation and there it is Neef. Of obviously there's lots of people who were born in the beginning of the 90s and their favorite animation is not Lion King, it's some other Disney animation and you know people born in the end of the 80s many of them have many of them love Beauty and the Beast like I do and then there are lots of people who have other favorite animation it can be anything I have a friend who is exactly the same age as I am and her favorite animation is Sleeping Beauty um, so obviously that varies a lot I just gave it as an example because Beauty and the Beast that when it came out in 1991 that was a huge blockbuster hit and then in 1996 when Lion King came out that broke all the records that Beauty and the Beast had made when Frozen came out, I think it was in 2013, correct me if I'm wrong, I can't remember that that well. That broke all the records that had uh, done in Disney um, way before. That broke all the Disney records before that. And also keep in mind that population of the world has been growing all the time, unfortunately. But let's focus on the 1991 Disney animation which is one of my 
favorite animations ever made. I love that animation. Nona, if you're watching this, I know you watch my videos. I cannot believe you still haven't seen Beauty and the Beast, so we need to watch this very soon. Classic number 30. <laughs> so Beauty and the Beast, it was 30th of Disney classic animations. And when the Little Mermaid came out in 1989, that was hugely popular. So in Disney, the 70s and the 80s, they were considered to be dark times. Some say that it was under the sleeping curse because they did not do very successful animations at that time and there was less and less money to use for animations. So when The Little Mermaid came out in 1989, that was a huge hit and people started to say that Disney magic is back and that's when people started to call it as the new renaissance especially when Beauty and the Beast came out next in 1991 that was even bigger than Little Mermaid Beauty and the Beast it was directed by Kirk Weiss and Gary Truesdale and it was the first animation that they ever directed there was a scriptwriter team hired to make the story alive there were voices hired there were songs recorded, the music was done by Alan Menken and Howard Ashman who already had worked together in Little Mermaid. Howard Ashman, he sadly passed away six months before the premiere of Beauty and the Beast and he died in AIDS. There, in the end of Beauty and the Beast there is dedication to Howard Ashman in the end credits and it says to Howard Ashman, the man who gave the man who gave Little Mermaid her voice and Beast his soul. It's very sad. Beauty and the Beast, it premiered in 13th of November 1991 and it was a huge hit. It was the most watched film around the world in 1991. It got three Golden Globes for the best movie and the best music. It was the first animated feature ever to become nominated for the best uh, film in Academy Awards. And this happened 10 years before in the Oscars there was even a category for animated uh, movies. So that was a huge honor for makers of Beauty and the Beast. It didn't win but it was a huge milestone for a, a history of animation for that animated film was nominated to be the best movie of the year in Academy Awards. Andrew Stasia, he created the character of Gaston. I could listen to him talk in hours and hours about animation and the animation process. <laughs> and I have a few of his um, animation books. Anyway, Andrew Stasia, he did he was the leading animator of the of um, Gaston because each each character has their own leading animator and then they have assistant animators to bring that character alive. Most of the time I tend to watch Disney animations in Finnish, especially if they are 90s animations because in the 90s there was really great voiceovers done for the Finnish Disney animations. I'm not a huge fan of these Disney voiceovers that are done in Finland for the past 10 years. Some of them are really good but some of them are just yeah. I really don't like it when they hire like the current pop stars or like reality TV stars to be voices for animations. I prefer to have like actors who are trained singers to be voices of animated characters. I love the Finnish voiceover on Beauty and the Beast. Mervi Hiltonen was the voice of Belle and Matti Ranin was the voice of Belle, Belle's father. If someone didn't know Matti Ranin, he actually directed some of the first first Disney animations in Finnish voiceovers in, like Snow White and Cinderella and stuff like that. Uh, in the 90s the director was mostly Pekka Lehtosari who, who in fact now works for Ghibli in Finland. Mervi Hilton, she's actually a Finnish opera singer and Eero Ruttunen who did Gaston, he's also a Finnish opera singer and he's amazing. But it's funny, I, I've seen Beauty and Beast in Finnish like 10,000 times, but it's one of those rare Disney films that I have also seen in other languages. I've seen it in French, Beauty and Beast in French, Trebon, and I've also seen the English version. And I like them all, actually, they're all very good. It's funny when I heard the French animation, the French voice of Belle, 
she sounds very similar to the Finnish voice of Belle, so it's quite nice. But then in Disney they have direct codes that all the animated voices, they need to have a bit similarity to the original American voice. So There's also the new version, the 2017 version with Emma Watson. I actually haven't seen that yet, now you're all like... Oh! <laughs> uh, it's on my list to watch because I do like Emma Watson. But then I, I, the clips, what I've seen from it, I, I think the animation for the Beast was just... Oh! But I think I will watch that at some point. And it's very interesting the way all the these modern f <laughs> retellings of Beauty and the Beast, the, all the film versions and all the different kinds of TV versions, they're all related to their own time. So in Beauty and the Beast it's very interesting because uh, it has two very active characters because it literally is the story of beauty and it is the story of the beast. So the both characters, they grow during the film animation from the 1991 it was inspired by the story of the Beaumont and they did change it a lot and they did keep some of the basic elements of it for example Belle she comes from the middle class in the animation uh, same way as in the in the book she comes from the middle class the father is not a you know merchant father is an inventor and all the siblings are taken away the envy sisters and uh, the brothers telling the Disney Beauty and Beast is very eccentric, same way as in the, in the original story, Belle is seen very different compared to her sisters because Belle, she is the daughter of the fairy, or she is just somehow seen more beautiful and more smarter than the other sisters, so sisters are very envy of her. In the Disney animation, those sisters, they are, those sisters and brothers, they are in a way the townspeople. And she is different because she is dressed because she is dresses differently than the others other people of the town. She wears blue and white and she's always reading a book and she's incredibly pretty. And also the beast in Disney animation, I think this is the most uh, biggest difference to these two different fairy tale versions written in the seventeenth century is that beast in Disney animation is not non-civilized. He is very civilized and he is very polite but in that Disney animation he is becoming more and more an animal because he's he easily gets rage he easily gets frustrated so uh, he's a tortured soul. Obviously there is the part in the beginning where you can see the Prince being very rude, very young man and being offensive and hurting the feelings of the old fairy woman. I think it's much nicer that uh, in the Disney version the old fairy woman was not uh, in love with the beast. That would have been very confusing. You will see that the beast character in Disney animation, he, he has grown a lot. He's actually thinking the things that he did wrong and then he's ashamed of himself and shamed of the way he looks and shame, shamed of the way he behaves and also probably shamed of the way he behaved when he was a man. I always find it quite amusing when people speak about Stockholm Syndrome in Beauty and the Beast and uh, then I, because I always compare that to the original fairy tales where, the, where it is based. The whole idea of beauty being captured captured, it's actually just a metaphor for arranged marriage. But then, especially in this book, it's actually the fairy godmother, the fairy godmothers who already arranged the marriage before the Belle and the Beast even knew each other. So all these different versions of Beauty and the Beast, they are always connected to their own time. The fairy tale versions, they are connected to their, to their own time and to the moral codes that were teached to young women. The 1991 Disney animation that has very powerful heroine who is not afraid to be eccentric. Then the newest one with Emma Watson, we have more feminist bell and there's, and there's also LGBT characters. And Beard and Beast, it is going to develop even more in the future because it is the tale as all this time. I will see you on my next video. Take care and bye.